My baby dolls, we're back again. This time we have a recurring guest on Genesis. We have the lovely Miss Gloria Loring, and uh, she was a recurring guest. Uh, she was a guest last year, last February. As always, I am your host, Ian Kahanowitz, and today we are going to talk with Gloria regarding uh, some of the stuff that's happened in her life in the last few months about uh, her article, her blog that she puts out every month on uh, how to drop uh, the drama, and we're going to be talking about self-meditation and stuff that she uh, does and has done for the last 25 years um, to get through the difficult points in life. Um, just a little recap about uh, who Glory is. She had a, a number one pop hit for anyone that lived during the 80s and saw uh, the soap opera Days of Our Lives, uh, Friends and Lovers. Um, she did write uh, the Facts of Life TV theme song and sing it, which anyone growing up in the late 70s, early 80s like I did, that was a staple in your life. She played Liz Chandler on Days of Our Lives for about six seasons or seven seasons, one or two, and she's authored uh, four different books on uh, diabetes and uh, cooking uh, cookbooks. And, of course, uh, back in around 2012, um, she wrote a book on uh, Coincidence, is God's way of remaining anonymous. Welcome to the show, Gloria. Thank you, Ian. It's nice to be here again with you. Oh, it's always nice to be here with you. Oh, it's just, you know, I gave your book, I recommend your book to everybody because everybody I know, including my own mother, cannot stop the drama through difficult times. And I know you've gone through... Um, a series of events within the last month where you lost co-workers on the Days of Our Lives, Mary Tyler Moore, uh, your ex-husband, uh, and how it affected the children. My question, uh, my first question is, is it tough getting to the point of the philosophy uh, that you have taken for the last 25 years to get through these rough points? Well, you know, life is a great gift. And we have it while it's here, and we're all uh, on an ex a, a warranty that's going to expire at some point. Our bodies are. Um, uh, my sister, about four years ago, passed. And, you know, the most important part of that was, for me, was that we had done everything we could to keep her in this life, to help her time in this life be as loving and supported as possible. So it was this amazing opportunity um, to be a loving presence. And ultimately, that's, that's what we're called to, I think. Um, depends on your viewpoint. But, you know, what can we do that expands our connection, our compassion, our um, appreciation? Um, how can we show up and be our best selves? And we get... You know, we get tired sometimes. My sister, for the last six weeks of her life, was here in my home, and it was 24-7, and my husband was here m most of that time. Um, and a couple times a few friends came in to care for her so I could get out and take a walk or do whatever. But um, it was a lot, and uh, but that was okay. I was so happy to have her here so I could be with her and but I remember one night um, she called me at 1 in the morning, and I had just gotten to sleep a little while before, and I was deeply asleep. And she called me up in my bedroom um, on her cell phone and said, I need you now. And I got up, and I thought, oh, God, I'm so tired. I don't, you know, grumble, grumble, grumble. And I started to walk down the hall to the back bedroom where she was living. And I suddenly thought, Gloria, wake up. You don't know how much time there is left. Step into that that door and be a heart-centered self. And I did, and I was able to help her. She was having a pain attack, and we got her medication and um, used some medical marijuana oil, CBD oil on her tongue, which relieved the anxiety immediately, and then the narcotics could go to work. And, you know, all this whole routine we had when the pain would attack. And... It was this great lesson to me, and, yeah, you can take a moment to grumble and then step up, girl, you know, <laughs> step right. up yourself. And, you know, my sister did the very best she could, and it was very clear when 
when the time came that her body could no longer support her spirit in this life. And there will come a time for all of us like that. And it's very hard, especially if you're very close to someone, especially if they're a daily part of your life. I mean, you feel the loss like a limb that's been, you know, taken away from you. Um, and, and ultimately, we have to find a new way of being. And, and that's, that's very challenging. But hopefully with loving friends and family and, and all of the great things that life can bring to us, the great new opportunities to find ourselves in this world, we can get through it and, uh, and move ahead and, you know, get back to being a, more grounded and, and um, less grief-stricken. And, you know, the grief will always be there. I mean, I was just thinking yesterday how much I miss my sister. I miss talking to her. But, you know, it is, it is what it is. I didn't get to talk to her every single day when she was in her body. Um, so today I don't get to talk to her. And then tomorrow I don't get to talk to her. And then the next day, you know. So it's a matter of, of acknowledging the grief that we have um, and not burdening ourselves with additional talk. Like, I'm all alone in the world now. There's nobody. There's nothing. I'm, you know, nobody loves me. All that kind of unfortunate self-talk we can get into. Um, but to look for the good and mourn the person, cry when we need to cry, but to try not to make it any worse than it already is. And, and that's very important because you show two different um, aspects of it, and you even write it um, in your recent column here. One is you showed empathy, and two, it's not this, um, you know, self-deprecation thing, you know, to make one slice of the eight slices of your pizza pie, um, the whole pie goes bad. It's only a one slice. However, with Peggy, and, and by the way, on a side note, was Peggy named after Peggy Lee back in the 1940s? Oh, you don't I don't hear... think so. my, my mom was thinking of naming her Margaret, uh, but she didn't want her to be called Maggie, so she decided to name her Peggy, and that would always be her, her nickname. I don't believe it had anything to do. She was born in 59. I don't think it oh. was Lee. Yeah. Oh. Because Buddy Holly uh, had Peggy Sue. Peggy so, Sue, uh, I used to, when she was little, I used to sing that song to her. Uh, I years older, I was, uh, I was her big sister. Yes. Yeah, because I just if you if you ever follow me, and I know you're uh, very busy, I usually post a this date in history kind of thing for my Facebook pro profile. So February third, you know, was the uh, was the passing of Buddy Holly. And the Big Bopper and, um, you know, uh, Richie Collins and, uh, like, um, today with the Beatles, uh, arrived in America in 1964. Oh my goodness. Oh, and I was, I was there in Miami Beach. I was in high school then and, uh, they came down to Miami Beach and I know friends that actually went down and waited in the crowd. I wasn't, I, that wasn't drawn to that, but it was, it was such an exciting time and, but we, you, you mentioned Alan before and right. Tyler Moore and Joe Mascola from Days of Our Lives. I mean, we right. all people who were very dear to me, each in a different way. Um, Mary was dear because, you know, my son Brennan has had diabetes mm -hmm. all these years since he was four. And Mary, you know, was a very private person. But there was a point at which she decided she needed to become a figurehead in in the search for, for a cure for diabetes, and she became the international celebrity chairperson for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. And I got to work with her here and there and uh, and talk with her occasionally when we'd be at events together. And she was such an amazingly talented lady and an iconic in, in the television industry, of course, and the, the role that was created for her and how she played that and so, you know, but but on the good side, you know, she did make it um, a long time with diabetes. I think she got diabetes when she was about 30. So she had diabetes over 50 years. So, you know, that's quite an achievement to get that far. So I, we have to give her credit for managing uh, managing that disease all those years. And, and uh, she was such an addition to our culture. 
Well, let me ask you this. When, when, when was the first time you met Mary uh, Tyler Moore? You know what? The first time I actually physically met her was at a Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation conference when she was introduced as the new head of, um, you know, public relations head of of our organization. And it was so exciting. People were just on their feet cheering and because it was such a boon to us to have someone with such um, great love for them to step into that role and talk about her diabetes, because she was pretty private, as I mentioned. Um, so right. Now, did she ever talk about her son? Uh, because it was like deja vu. She made ordinary people with Donald Sutherland. The same year, her only son of 24 years old accidentally shot himself with a shotgun. Yeah, no, no, and that's not a No. Up, no. I was I was not an intimate friend of hers, and oh. the point where she did not talk about that anyway. Um, you know, that's 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 almost too painful to be discussed, isn't it? It is because you know that it's it's because the deja vu is I was, I was ten years old. You were you were an adult by that time. But I do recall the movie being about a woman who could not get over her son's death. And it was a role that she never played before. It was a dramatic role. And then this happens in real life, which is almost similar to what she endured in the movie, which broke down her marriage to Donald Sutherland and, you know, almost ignored the other son in the film. And I think... If I'm not um, mistaken, she divorced her husband a year later in real life. So all these things got caught up in Mary Tyler Moore at the time. And it's just it's just amazing how she just trudged on, though. And uh, she could have used your uh, book for a little help, I think, because uh, uh, that's really Well, I think she enough. did it with great dignity, and, and it's not for me to judge or have an opinion about that. Um, she had, you know, she had a great deal of strength in her, no doubt. Now, was she a role model to you? Like, she was, Did you ever see the episode with uh, Oprah Winfrey 20 years ago when she came on the show to surprise Oprah Winfrey and Oprah started crying because Mary oh. Tyler Moore got... I don't think she was a role model in, in, in the sense that I looked at her and said, oh, that's what I want to be uh, consciously, but I think she was a role model for all young women that you could have a career and, and have... You know, have your feet on the ground, and so I think that role and the way she played it was definitely. Now, at the time when the Mary Tyler Moore show was on, uh, basically you were I, you were I think in Vegas, and you were also traveling with with uh, such stars as Bob Hope, uh, Johnny Bench, for God's sakes, of uh, Cincinnati Reds fame, and um, you know, women. You didn't you didn't see women in that kind of work role that you saw Mary Tyler Moore in. You know, they were still like Mrs. Brady. It really wasn't until the 1980s where you saw more of the women uh, playing a role in the, in, the, in the household. Do you think um, the Mary Tyler Moore spearheaded that uh, and mixed with that the me decade where women, you know, are coming forward and, and being equal with men in, in the sense of being a breadwinner? Whenever you have, you know, it's just like our having had, uh, an African, uh, half African American president. You know, mm -hmm. once someone gives us a new way to see, um, it's hard to forget that. I mean, you can fight it if you want, but but Mary's role um, was a game changer, definitely. And we have to thank, of course, the writers and the producers who thought that it was time to have that. Um, you know, there were a lot of Norman Lear was probably the leader. In, in that sort of uh, new iconic personalities and role models for us. Um, he did it time and time again, didn't he? He did. Now, you know, uh, and that was very unexpected. Uh, all I know is that she went into the hospital, and then a few days uh, she had passed out, but she did live to 80. Now, the death of Alan, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Now, the death of Alan Thick was a little bit different than your sister Peggy because it was sudden, no, you know, yeah. with Peggy, you know, and, and, and how did, you know, how does your children, um, you know, take the guidance that you have put out there for all of us 
take your motherly love because like you said in the article, you know, how do we find our way forward? Well, I don't know how they take it. You'd have to ask them. I don't ask them how they right. take it. I think, okay. I think they're glad to still have a mom. Um, they lost their dad. Um, it was hugely shocking, of course. They they showed great forbearance and dignity um, at the, the memorial tribute we had for him um, that weekend, just days after uh, Robin and Brennan and Carter all organized it and did a beautiful job. It was um, there were over 200 people, and Bill Maher got up and talked and made us laugh, and there were stories about Alan that made us laugh, and there was a lot of hugging, and it was it was really beautiful. And then the next day there was a very private, just intimate family um, uh, burial, uh, funeral burial. Um, I didn't attend that. I didn't feel it was my place. Um, but, you know, it, it, the great thing about the one one young girl was crying a lot. She's a friend of Carter, Alan's son, friend of her his girlfriend, and she was crying a lot. And I said it really saddens you. And I thought, wow, this is interesting. She's not a family member, and she's sobbing. And so obviously it triggered other things in her. But I told her something someone had once told me. I said, when we lose someone, we can think of what was the quality that we liked best about them, that we loved best, that spoke to us? What, what's the thing we'll miss the most? Oh, I'll miss his friendliness. I'll miss his, his sense of humor. I'll miss whatever. And then we can make a decision to have more of that in our own life, um, to, to, you know, look at things with a witty perspective, to be more compassionate, to be friendly, to extend ourselves Whatever that quality is that we feel, well, I'll, I'll so miss his this, you know. We can then be that in life. And now what a great way to memorialize another person. Um, so I, I told her that, and she said, oh, that really helps. Because it helped me when I was told it. I don't remember who told it to me. But, but it's a great little technique to uh, help us go forward. You know, and I think, was he living in uh, British Columbia? He's a huge hockey fan. Uh, um, I got oh, pictures no, no, of he his... lived in, in Santa Barbara, near Santa Barbara. Oh, oh all right. So yeah, he California. lived in Santa Barbara, but he was down in Los Angeles playing mm-hmm. hockey with his son at a pickup league and um, then had this, you know, kind of felt a little paralyzed or uh, limited and had chest pains, and they, of course, called the paramedics and all of that, and he was cracking jokes as they took him away, mm-hmm. and um, he evidently, evidently had... Uh, some kind of an, an event that is just, you know, you don't recover from. So you know, no, I haven't no, no. heard the actual uh, – my, my friend used to work for the American Heart Association, and she told me what she felt it must be, but that's not for me to say. So, No, and that's absolutely fine. Now, uh, Joseph Moscolo, how was your relationship when, uh, with him? He played the very evil Stefano De Mera, but I remember him from Jaws back in the 70s. He wanted to – Opened the beaches. He had a uh, a very long career. I mean, I think he died. He was 87 years old. And you know, he was a he was quite a, a a musician. He was a clarinet player. He played with symphony orchestras. He was an amazingly talented man. The funny story I, I have to tell about Joe Muscolo was he was a very committed as an actor, and um, he would come into. I didn't know him at first. He just played this character. And sometimes we would run lines in the morning, and he would be talking in that accent, the the Stefano De Mira accent, all day. And I thought, oh, that's who he is. That's he's got an Italian accent, and that's how he talks. And then um, something happened, and I was asked to please give him a call at home to notify him about something. And I called him, and he picked up the phone, and said hello. I went, uh, oh, is Joe Mascola there? He says, this is Joe. And I went. This is Joe because <laughs> he didn't. Have that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, when I go, so that it's it's natural for me when I go in to to work, I speak that way all day. So it's just a continuation, and it's not something I put on. It's something that I'm I'm steeped in. And I thought, what a great lesson in acting. That's wonderful. So anyway, he was that- he he was a wonderful actor. He was very supportive. Um, he was quite a character. Uh, <laughs> he was a personality. Just he was just like Stefano. He was a big personality. 
And let me ask you, you were on the show, Liz Chandler, I think, was married to his brother, Tony DeMera, if I recall. Teo Penglis played that role, yeah. Teo's a character, yeah, he's he's a lot of fun. We have, we both have December birthdays, and of course, like two hotheads, we would occasionally clash, but we always got along, and I, I always... Uh, we, we we needle each other. We poke at each other when we're together. Yeah, <laughs> we're very funny. But I I like him so much, and he's he's a wonderfully flamboyant presence. And I lay, the, I saw a picture um, last month. Uh, you you met uh, with uh, Bill and Susan Hayes, uh, Doug and Julie, for God's sakes, from yes, Days of Our we Lives. Were both- uh, and a, an, an autograph event in Hollywood, a Hollywood event or something last year, and uh, I love seeing them. And a couple of times I've seen them at the uh, Los Angeles Opera, and we'll visit and I'll see them in another row and wave, and, you know, so we, we get a chance to say hello for a few minutes. And they're still doing well. They look healthy, and they're still very creative. They, In fact, they... Um, they had a book out that uh, I bought their book and read it, and it was wonderful. It was a historical novel and uh, about show business and theater and back in the day and whenever, I think, 1800s or 1700s. And it was, uh, it was really, really well done. He's, um, he's in his 90s, I think, Bill, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know, but I would say, I would say definitely um, upper 80s probably, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. He's, he's amazing. He's very vital and uh, just just as strong as ever, as far as I can see. If I get them on the show here, would you come along and, uh, you know, we'll have like a four-way calling here or something, and maybe people will call in? Because I'd like, I'd like to get them on the show because being a little boy, my mother watched Days of Our Lives since 1965 when it first came out with McDonald Carey and stuff, and you know, I always like, are you going to be watching Doug and Julie today? Because they were pretty much the stars in the early 70s. And uh, it, it just takes me back to such a place where I used to get sick from school and stay home and watch you uh, and Stefano DeMera and Doug and Julie and the grandmother and grandfather, McDonald Carey, and Bowen Hope and, and all this. Now, this brings me to a new question. We know NBC picked up the contract. I forgot that name, the talk show host. And there's been talk of days being pulled from the air. Do you think that Days of Our Lives has run its course? I don't know. I mean, that's going to, uh, you know, I don't watch it. I, I don't watch television during the daytime because I have things to do. Right. But, um, uh, you know, it, it'll be a shame to lose it after 50-plus years. Um, but it, you know, everything has its course, and 50 years is not a bad run. No, it isn't. But uh, those characters, all of them, um, have literally become, you know, in people's lives. Just like you wrote in your book, you're like, hey, there's Liz Chandler and stuff. Because you do come into people's houses. You do make an impact on what your um, character does. Now, your character sang. And, of course, you had the song Friends and Lovers, which was showcased um, on the show. Uh, with Days of Our Lives, and then we went through the whole legal bickering and everything else that happened. Um, do you think uh, between, you know, not only your book here, but the fact that you, you made really beautiful albums, I've listened to them all, because now I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have Amazon uh, Prime, and I, I get to listen. You even made one with your son, Robert. Uh, Robert. Uh, but the thing is, is that you have made a huge impact uh, on diabetes, uh, soap operas, singing, and with this book, you know, it, it's more than just being a celebrity as it is being a teacher of some sort. Well, I think we're all teachers, and I think the bottom line is what are we teaching? And, you know, I've tried to learn and therefore be uh, compassionate and patient. I had to work very hard at learning to be patient with myself, with others. Um, we're all teaching, and you know, I do it through the the, the uh, column I write for Soap Opera Digest. I did it in my books. I did it in my work for Juvenile Diabetes Foundation to open people's hearts to what it's like to have diabetes and how difficult it is, so they don't think it's oh, you just take your shot and that's it, right? And well, no, it's a whole lot more than that. Um, you know, there there is so much good work to be done in this world, 
and there are so many people doing good work. You know, we, we sometimes tend to look at the one piece of litter on the ground instead of the clean park in front of us that goes on for acres and, and oh, look at people littering, you know, but we forget that there are a thousand people who didn't litter. You, you know, instead of looking for the bad, look for the good. Um, and we can clean up the stuff that needs cleaning up, but still focus on there are so many good people in this world who are teaching by example of what it means to be a great human being. And, you know, it's fun because you're very patient, and that's very that's very important because in November, just before, I think you released this at the end of October, before I got uh, sick, like we mentioned on the uh, beginning before I started the show, uh, you wrote an article, and I think it was in your book, and, you know, years ago you had a woman that really annoyed you. She really bugged you, you know. And, you know, because I read, I read your stuff, you know. It, <laughs> You, you know, I mean, you know, I think all women should read your stuff. I think all guys should read your stuff because um, I'm a ferocious reader, and uh, I've gotten to know you a little bit. And um, what you what you say makes perfectly good sense. But tell the story about this because it's really um, it's really something to behold. Okay, this was the November column. Yeah, it was the November column, and uh, you know, um, I met a young woman who really annoyed me, no matter what subject we discussed, she presented herself as an expert. And a lot of people... Oh, yes! <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of people, you know, you know, they, they couldn't even live it. Oh, they didn't walk in your shoe, but yet they know the answer. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, what I have seen, and, and most psychologists would tell us, is there's, there's a, a mechanism called projection, and we very often project onto others those things that we are also guilty of. Um, and, you know, we'll say, oh, she's just so impatient. I just can't stand how impatient she is. And then, then it's very simple to just stop and say, am I ever impatient? And, of course, the answer would always be, well, yes. So we're, we're very good at looking at the bad thing in others that um, is also something we could clean up in ourselves. It's that those who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones kind of thing. And, of course, the more vehement we are about someone else's faults, the more certain it is that our own fault of that same type needs correcting. Um, and we've seen it, haven't we, in some public figures where someone's a crusader against mm -hmm. child pornography or they're, and they're, they're out there and they're – preaching and they're this and they're, you know, or, or prostitution. And meanwhile, they are engaging in the very activities that they are out trying to be a figurehead against. And it's this thing that, you know, we try to correct in the world what most needs correcting in our own lives. Um, and so I've, I've now, I use that all the time. The minute I start to, start to find fault with someone else, I will immediately or as quickly as possible, say, do I ever do that? And, of course, the answer is always yes, because I do everything everybody else does. So it makes me more patient, more compassionate, more understanding that others have their faults, and so do I. And, you know, let's all just figure a way to be compassionate to each other. <laughs> no, and you know, and you, know it's, um, you know what's important, because I'm going to ask you another thing here. Um, did you ever have a friend or a group of friends where else, you know, you had something on your heart, no matter what it was, and you would, you know, tell them your problems, but they would try to outdo your problems with their problems, and it really wasn't, you know, working. It's almost like, well, you have a problem, but I got a worse problem, and they're not empathizing with you. They're, they're just, you know, it's me, 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 although it's about you. Yeah, well, that's just neediness. There are people who are like deep wells of need, and and we we can also feel compassionate for them because obviously they had um, experiences along the way that did not uh, encourage their own sense of self, their sense of possibility or or goodness in themselves, and so they're they're constantly needy. They constantly need to be reassured. Um, 
you know, what are you going to do? I mean, you probably do the same thing. So do I. There are times I need to be reassured. I've gotten to the point where I'm pretty good at reassuring myself. Um, but, I mean, we're all we're all in this together. And if we can see that others are just they're doing the best they can, they really are, even people who do terrible things, that's quite frankly the best they can do at that point. And we have to hope and maybe pray and maybe support and encourage, I mean, people to to do better, people especially in our immediate lives. And listening. You know, sometimes somebody needs just to be listened to and um Sure enough, if if we acknowledge and listen instead of refuting, then we have a chance of uh, encouraging them and filling in their neediness a little bit more. I think when I read your book, um, at that time I was going through a very difficult time around 2012 because I had built this image up in myself. You know, I was a poor kid from Brooklyn. I worked very hard, um, yeah. became a became a tax lawyer. Uh, but I made so many mistakes socially, I and mean, even in my own marriage. I mean, I'm married now 19 years. You're married, what, 23, 24 years, I think, you're married, if I'm not mistaken. 22. Oh, okay. yeah. That was a good Yeah, I mean, so I told, and you know, and I, I built up, um, because I did it myself, such a resentment within my wife over the years, because I had 32 years of education, um, I, I had built this thing up since I was a little boy, saying, i got to get out of Brooklyn. i got to get out of the ghetto. i got to do this. Then when I finally achieved some sort of 15 minutes of fame or whatever you want to call it, it's almost like your head's in the cloud and you're not empathizing. Now, um, I made so many mistakes in my marriage, so many mistakes, that I told her, uh, probably before I got sick in, in 2013 when the diabetes started kicking in on my feet, I said, I have made 99.9% of the mistakes in our marriage. I said, you probably never thought I would say it, but you were right. And it became a thing of forgiveness uh, by her, uh, a better understanding after all those years of marriage. But I think in your book, you know, let it go. You know, let anything within you go. We all mess up. We all make a mistake. Yeah, forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is hard. And depending on how, uh, where we are in our own growth, uh, uh, spiritual growth. And spirit remembers your essential energy. I mean, so is your energy holding on to, to, uh, slights or, or things that people have done, done you, they've done me wrong, you know? <laughs> um, and where, wherever we are, and, and the bigger picture we can have of life, you know, there, are, people who maybe hurt me in some way or I felt hurt by them years ago, and now, 20, 30, 40 years later, I don't even remember what it is they said that I got hurt about. You know, that's so, so as you get a bigger picture of life um, and a bigger picture of our own participation in things that happen that might be hurtful, I mean, you know, every one of us has hurt somebody, not maybe not purposely. Maybe we've never tried to hurt anybody, but we have because we said something that was what we needed to say but was not what the other person needed to hear. So, you know, having some compassion, having some forgiveness. I, the people that I'm always so amazingly impressed by are people who can forgive murder. I mean, those people in South Carolina who oh. forgave proof. I mean, that was just... That was so heart-wrenching, and I think it was an example to everyone in this country. I mean, is there anything more dreadful than having a loved one taken from you so violently? And for them to just a day or two later say, I forgive you, or I'm working on it, but at least they were working on it, you know? Um, those people are heroes in my sight, in my heart. Uh, so... Yeah, we can we can look at the people who I mean, look at Nelson Mandela. What he spent twenty seven years and twenty seven years. years. Yep, yeah, and then he came out and he became the president of uh, South Africa. But he forgave. He forgave. Even along the way, he forgave his jailers. He started to make friends with them instead of holding on to bitterness and poisoning his own mind and heart. 
So, I mean, you know, there are great examples, and, and uh, certainly one of the great examples that is known the world over is the one they call Jesus, who on, you know, as he's being killed, is saying, please forgive them, they know not what they do. And that's a phrase that I've used in my own life many times, Gloria, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. I mean, if if a person in that situation, with that pain, with that agony, can say forgive them, then why should I be any less than that? So we can always look to an example for that. The thing is, it is, and you're absolutely right, the hardest thing to do in this lifetime is tap into, through the layers of onion of hurt and whatever other emotion you're going through, and just dig out that kind of thing saying, I forgive you. Well, sometimes, I don't, I, I'm not sure. I guess you'd have to talk to a psychiatrist or psychologist. I, maybe it can be dug out, but maybe it's just a matter of letting go, as you mentioned. Um, just it comes up and, oh, rrr, 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 and we want to grr, 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 you know. <laughs> and no, I mean. I want to grab the reins and fight struggle again and you just say Gloria put it down just put it down that's you mentioned meditation and you know meditation is just the opportunity to turn away from what the mind wants to grab up and wrestle with and you just keep literally keep saying no put it down put it down because at the center of being is peace there is peace Um, we see it in little babies' eyes when they look at us and they look at us so purely because their mind is not busy with all kinds of crap. You know, their mind is pure consciousness, pure loving presence. And we say, aren't they wonderful? Isn't that fabulous? And Well, we have that. We didn't lose it. We just got really busy with lots of events and, you know, hurts and, and exciting stuff and, you know, the mind, the mind, the mind, the mind. Um, but at the center of being is this place of perfect peace, perfect stillness, and all the great spiritual masters have told us about it. Um, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven dwells within. Oh, huh, me? Yeah. So um, it's for each of us to find in our own way, in our own time. Um, and But the more we practice it, the more we will be able to access it. Now, lastly, what I want to get to here is, you're a motivational speaker. Do you do that live, Gloria, or do you do it by video, or do you do it by tape recording? Because you have a lot of stuff to give good uh, motivational conversations to groups or individuals. Well, I have done that, and I'm, I'm uh, invited by uh, cor- corporations and nonprofits to speak here and there, and, and I, always, uh, I always love doing that. Um, you know, and, and I, I think whether we're doing it for big groups or we're doing it just for someone in our own life to, you know, there may be someone who says, oh, I'm so discouraged about such and such. And we can listen to, listen to them, first of all, and really understand where they are and then encourage them and maybe find a story. You know, I remember when I was feeling that way and, you know, it took another two years before that got resolved for me, but it did get resolved or I found my way through it and, you know, just to let, especially young people, you know, they want things right now and just the way they want it and it, it can be tough. It can be very tough. Life is life is uh, quite, a, <laughs> quite a journey. Well, you know what I put out uh, from, uh, if you can recall, in 1980, uh, when John Lennon was murdered, he had a song called Beautiful Boy uh, on his album. Oh. And, uh, you remember that, Close Your Eyes. But I think the big thing, what, what, what goes along with your aspect of coincidence and meditation is, and people got to realize this, and this is very important, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Yeah, that's a great quote. I don't know. I don't know that... John originated that, but he might have. But it, it is true. Life happens. And our biggest challenge sometimes is just to pay attention to what's going on now. Because somehow now is always manageable in some way or other. I mean, even if you think of even the process of dying, you know, um, if, if you're not in horrendous pain, and heaven knows they've got great drugs for that, you're going to be alive, and you're going to be alive, and you're going to be alive, and then you're going to be on the other side. Boom. There you go. You know? Now, let me, 
So go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting you, Gloria. It's my bad. Yeah, something's uh, making noise. Oh, it's probably my phone. <laughs> it's probably my phone. That's fine. Let me ask you this. Are you going out on tour this year? Are you going to be performing anywhere? Um, I'm working right now on um, memorizing a, a one-woman show called The Lady with All the Answers, and it's the uh, a play about Ann Landers, and I will be uh. at the Annenberg Theater in Palm Springs in April for two weeks, and uh, it's it's a wonderful challenge, and I'm excited and terrified all at the same time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what. How would you like to come back and uh, do the show after you get done in Palm Springs? We could talk about it. Okay, we'll, t we'll, we'll work on doing that. That sounds like fun, yes. It's a wonderful play. It's very touching. She's quite a lady. And wasn't her sister, dear, um, dear Abby, Abby? Uh, also? Yeah, they were, they yeah. were, they were serious. You gotta wonder how two, uh, two of them grew up to advise the world, uh, in separate ways, but it's an amazing well, thing with them. The, that's all, that's all delineated how that happened in the play. Oh, that's not Maybe I should get a ticket and go down there and see in Pine. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hold the line, Gloria. This is how I end it. Folks, it's always good to have Gloria Loring on the show. She brings such inspiration. Uh, just just by the, the, the things that, you know, all of us can incorporate into our lives. Um, I hope you enjoyed the show. And as always, in the immortal words of Edward R. Morrow, good night, folks, and good luck. Take care.